want to talk a little bit about the timeline of uh, when HB committed suicide and what happened after that. Okay, so based on the best evidence we have, he committed suicide by mercury cyanide on the 4th of November, which was a Thursday. His body of suicide notes were discovered on Friday, okay, through the, by way of the radio. People in Texarkana heard, as well as travel, people in Texarkana heard of HB's suicide and confession of murders. Funeral arrangements were made the same day the body was discovered. There was then a private funeral the very next day. Texarkana Gazette also began to run its, run its headlines that same day. Um, James G. Freeman served as a pallbearer on Saturday uh, at the funeral uh, that was held at H.B. Tennyson's house that same day. It's almost certainly the case that James Freeman was among the other Texarkanians who first heard about H.B. suicide uh, on November 5th, Friday. Um, and certainly, obviously, he knew about it by the time he was serving as a pallbearer on Saturday, but probably the family would have had to communicate with him to arrange for him to be a pallbearer. So he almost, James Freeman almost certainly knew about the suicide on Friday, like most Texarkanians. Yet on Sunday, two days after HB's body was discovered, James Freeman mysteriously, rather than going to the police, he goes to an assistant deputy, or deputy prosecutor, Robert Hall, and that evening, and tells Robert Hall that, oh, by the way, HB has an alibi. He and I were at HB's house the night of the Starks attack. And it also turns out that Robert Hall was a close high school friend of HB's older brothers, Craig and JD. They, they knew each other, as well as Robert's brother, Rick Hall, who recently passed away. So um, it's very strange that if, if uh, James Freeman, he certainly would have thought about, you know, if, if, if HB is confessing to the Starks killing, and, and that becomes known to Texas Canyons on Friday, James, if James Freeman actually had been with HB, it's inexplicable why he would not have told someone on Friday. It makes no sense that there would be a two-day delay before he would tell someone and it also doesn't make sense that he would go to the assistant deputy prosecutor, Robert Hall. My, my theory is, is that James Freeman was probably lying about this, and probably it was an idea that came to him sometime on Saturday, possibly at, at the funeral of HB, possibly in cons consultation with other people who were in attendance of that funeral. Um, the other thing um, is, uh, that's, that's telling is, despite the poignant nature of a new murder having occurred when people were already on edge, when the texture chemist had said, asked James Freeman, well, how did you learn about the Starks attack? Um, he basically expressed this uncertainty. Um, he, he, he basically said, well, we either heard it on the radio or someone came in and told us. But it wasn't a specific, you know, reflexive answer like, I remember exactly how I learned about it and here's how. So that's kind of strange because we know during a poignant event like 9-11 or, or, or an assassination of a president, we remember exactly how we learned <coughs> about those things. But yet he equivocates when asked about it and that's kind of strange. Um, the newspaper said, quote, to the, to the best of his recollection, that James Freeman told him, they heard of the murder over the radio or someone came in and told them about the killing. Why so uncertain? Well, I, I think that's because he's lying, most likely. I don't know for sure, but I, I think it's more likely than not. It doesn't necessarily mean that James Freeman believed that H.B. was the phantom killer. He might have simply been trying to engage in public relations to help lessen the stigma of the Tennyson family, okay? <coughs> that, so there, there are more than one motivation by, for which he might have been lying, but I think he probably was. Okay, but yet nonetheless, three days later, the Texarkana Gazette runs a story that says, quote, the statement of James Freeman, 16-year-old Texarkana youth and boyhood friend of Tennyson, eliminates all possible connection Tennyson might have had with one case, the two sheriffs said. Now, this is just ridiculous on the face of it. It's ridiculous. First of all, you have one person's word against another. Why would you say one person's word which contradicts another eliminates or, or proves that the other person was lying? It doesn't. It just means you have two people who contradict each other. And uh, I asked that question on uh, Facebook. I said, does anyone know of any reason why you should consider James Freeman to be more reliable? And someone uh, said, well, Freeman didn't write a variety of suicide notes, didn't hide some of them, uh, uh, offer riddles as clues to find them, and didn't kill himself. Duty did, and I think most would agree those are not rational actions. Well, as I mentioned, I think, earlier in the interview with Vinny, turns out, like H.B. Tennyson, James Freeman did kill himself, although he didn't do so until he was around 42 years old. And um, that's a story in and of itself. So, so um, James's freather John, according to James's nephew, reported that before James killed himself, James made a comment that caused John to fear that James might also kill him. So, so James Freeman is a person of interest, not only for these reports of sexual molestation by one woman directly who, as an eyewitness, says it happened to her. She also says she talked to someone else. Also, the things he said that made Minnie Wood uncomfortable. Also, the things his, his family have said as well. Um, he had this pos uh, unusual habits. He never married. He, won he married once, but was only married for six weeks. He didn't live the rest of his life with his mother at the mother's house. Um, 
they say he spent large amounts of time alone in the back room. This is all from his family who, with whom I spoke. When he came out of the room, family members described James as unkempt and having noticeable body odor. And uh, one family member, the woman who says that he molested her, also said that, quote, he was known to the police. She didn't elaborate further. So he is a person of interest. You know, I don't, I don't know what to think, but, but certainly he's a person of interest. Okay, now, now moving more to my family specifically. Um, were there white lies? Were the Tennyson family inclined to tell white lies um, after H.B. committed suicide? Would it be normal to tell white lies given that the damage of murders was already done and H.B. was already dead? Was there a chance of retaliation or stigma towards the Tennyson family if people believe H.B.? Possibly. Um, H.B.'s sister, Alice Jo, wrote handwritten memoirs, which I have uh, copies of. They were in, in actually her handwriting. She, she said she was talking about the financial socioeconomic strife um, that occurred after her father left the family. She said, quote, I joined recitation class in Patty Hill when mother got the bill. She flipped. She didn't know what I had done. She did not have the money for special classes. Same with milk at recess. 15 cents a week was not always available. So I learned how to lie to cover up. I could play the organ like my Aunt Mary, but not the piano. The school had no organ, so they could not prove me wrong. So, so there was this pressure to kind of again, maintain a sense of social standing. Um, so another question that comes up is, did HB have access to or know how to drive a car in 1946? Did HB have access to and know how to use guns in 1946? His siblings said things to suggest that he didn't know how to use a gun or didn't know how to drive a car, yet those claims have been disputed by other family members. Um, they've certainly been questioned at the very least. And some, the, some of the people I've interviewed in the family who were first cousins think it's very unlikely that he did not know how to drive a car. They also think it's very unlikely not only because of the pictures I've shown you that he had experience with a gun as a child at the very least, I think it's very unlikely that he did not know how to use a gun. I mean, he might not have been a marksman or an expert, but the idea that he wouldn't have known how to use it despite his experience is unbelievable. Okay, so, so based on my interviews, that's why I say that statement. Um, this is Rule Beasley. He was a graduate in HB's class from 1948. He's still alive and well and mentally very sharp and lives in Oregon. I interviewed him in Los Angeles, and this is what he had to say. Good morning. My name is Rule Curtis Beasley. I was born on August the 12th, 1931. And I'm here being interviewed by John Tennyson, who is a historian archivist who lives now in Houston, Texas, but who grew up in Texarkana across the alley from a house where I grew up in Texarkana. So um, even though you and George started out in kindergarten together, um, you were a year older than, a year younger. Yes, right, than one George. year younger than everyone else who was in the same grade as I. But because of starting out at the same time at kindergarten, you ultimately both graduated Arkansas High School in 1948. Yes, yes. Excellent. And of course, I have, I have uh, two, two relatives, John Urgel and H.B. Tennyson, who were also in that same class. I knew them well. I got my driver's license when I was 13 years old. Oh, wow. And so, my dad just went down and said, this boy needs a license, so they just wrote it out and handed it to me. So, th so it was perfectly legal for, for a 13-year-old to have a license? Yeah, yeah. I did not realize that. I didn't have to take a test of any kind, no written test, no driver's test. Wow. wow. I didn't have to show a birth certificate. My dad just said, this is my son, his name's Rule. The guy wrote out <laughs> driver's license and gave it to me. So if you were, how about if you were, if you were 12, was there a limit on the age? Or? I don't even know that. Interesting. Probably not. <laughs> Interesting. So, but, but no doubt from your personal experience, you, you at least could get it as young as 13. Yeah. Amazing. Because I know when I, when I grew up, you could drive at 14, but you had to have an, uh, like an adult accompany you. And then you could drive, I think, by yourself at 16. So yeah. They got a little more uh, weary of kids driving, I guess. <laughs> That's fascinating. So, yeah, I, I wonder. I, I'm, I'd like to look into that more and see, like, what, if there was a lower limit to the age. But, but we know at least 13 was was a, allowable. It sure was interesting. If they did, they enforce that if they caught someone driving who didn't have a driver's license, was that uh, grounds for? A, that a hardly ticket? ever happened. Okay, in the sense that everyone would have a driver's license. Well, if you didn't, it, uh, they didn't bother you. Okay. You oh, could they, have one or not have one, and it didn't really make that much difference. Oh, okay. They, they really didn't enforce. Very lax. Uh -huh. Okay. So if, if they stopped you and you didn't have a driver's license, you likely would not get a ticket. But this was in the early 1940s, you know. Yeah. yeah. I got my license. I was 13 years old in 1944. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. I, I, you know, I know that, like, in, in analogous to that, I know that the, the 
enforcement or the concern about kids walking around with BB guns and in the neighborhoods got increased over the years as well. So now tell me, tell me about that. I know that it was pretty common. Like when I grew up, my, my brother, older brother Trip would walk around the neighborhood with his BB gun and occasionally shoot blue jays and squirrels and mm -hmm. blackbirds and things. Yeah. That, but was that pretty common when you grew my up? My brother and I used to do that too. I shot a bird once and I saw it fall and I was so sorry that I ever shot that bird. I really felt sorry for the bird. I, yes, I, I enjoyed target practice and I was not so much into like seeing things die. So. I didn't like it either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I can I can identify with that. Interesting. But you know, when we first went to Denton many years later, in 1966, we lived in a house in Denton that had an alley, paved alley, and once I saw a couple of boys walking up and down with BB guns shooting in the trees. How how common was it? I mean, with regard to not just BB guns, but back to the driving. Was it pretty common for 13-year-olds to have their licenses? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think it was norm, normal thing to do. Mm -hmm. I think most of my friends did that. Mm -hmm. And if you had, even if you didn't have your own car, was, was it, if you were 13 years old, was it common for you to be driving your parents' cars? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and I really liked band more than any class I took in high school. Yeah, I would love to hear more about the, the band. That, and how many students would you estimate were in the Arkansas High Band when you were coming through? I would say about 60. About 60. It was a marching band, mm -hmm. like you say, in the football season. We always did a football show mm -hmm. every every week. But it was a home game. And there was there was a, a traditional format of a halftime show? Yeah. That, it was, that was even then? Show. We only had one junior high then. Okay. And that building probably still is gone, long okay. gone, but it was between Garland and Locust, I believe. Okay. And the cross street was uh, 10th. So the students that you knew as being in your class in junior high school were the same students that, that continued mm -hmm. on the high school. That's right. So ever so if, unless the, they the moved class, to... The seventh grade class stayed intact to the eighth grade, ninth grade, and all the way through high school. Okay, that yeah, that's, it has a much more continuity that way. And a lot of them were from College Hill, mm -hmm. and I remember them walking to school wow. from College Hill. Every morning, you'd see this long line of peop young people walking to school. So I, I know from what I, I think a couple of them were teachers, the principal and the band director, but in that class photo that we looked at before, there are approximately 100 people, so maybe about 98. That, that was about the size of the senior class, about okay. 100. Uh -huh. Okay. And so if, if that was the size of the senior class, about what fraction of those do you think were in marching band, if you had to guess? Oh, of the seniors, maybe t 20 or 30. Okay. At the most. Okay, of course, and the marching band was composed of of, all of people three grades. all three grades, tenth, eleventh. Occasionally, some 12. people from the ninth grade were in the marching band. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, is it was would you say that the marching band was was a small enough group that everyone knew each other by name? Yeah. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. We had a a long trip to the Cotton Festival in Memphis, Tennessee, one spring, when I was a senior, and uh, we filled the bus with. Uh, band members, about 40 or 45 people, took the bus from Texarkana to Memphis, spend the night sleeping on the floor of a gymnasium, maybe two nights, and then marched in the uh, Cotton Club Parade downtown Memphis. Oh, wow. If you were to look at the, the people who were in marching band during your senior year of high school, were most of those already involved in band in junior high? Well, it was possible to be in the band as early as the seventh grade. Okay. And, and I remember seeing people like Pete Camp in the photo mm -hmm. who played baritone horn. I remember seeing him carrying his baritone horn up the street about a block or two from junior high to high school for band practice oh, wow. in the middle of the, of the day. <laughs> it, when he was in junior high still? Yeah, when he was in the seventh grade. So oh, wow. in the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, he would you know, march and several others would. I think maybe John Urkel started in the seventh or eighth grade on Could clarinet. So, or so you're saying that they were actually participating in the high school band? Yeah. In, yeah. Despite the fact they were in seventh grade. That's right. There was oh. no such thing as a junior high band. There was just one band. I, okay, that's a that's a keen just insight. Okay. One band. There was a single. Okay, there was a single band that was common to both the junior high and high school. Yeah. I did not know that. Okay, that's that's that that changed when I went through obviously. Oh the, sure, yeah. Yeah. There was a, eventually there was a separate band director for junior high. Mm -hmm. Lida Oliver Beasley's father, Rule, 
was a junior high band director. So at the point he became band director, they had dichotomized it into a yeah. junior high band and, mm -hmm. a, and a high school band. Sure. It, what year do you think that happened where they separated it? I don't know. But it was after 48? Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah, because that's when I got out of high school. It was well after 48. Okay. So through the 1940s, there was just a single band common to the junior high and high school. Mm -hmm. I did not realize that. So, so of the so I get, is it safe to say that the people who were in seventh grade, um, who performed at the high, were, were 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 there some seventh graders who were allowed to go on trips where others were not? Or well, I don't know about the trips. I, I'd just be guessing on that. Okay. Uh, for this long trip to Memphis, I don't think everybody went because the bus would only hold 40 people. And I just remember one bus. So, so I guess a misconception <laughs> I had. Or maybe there were two buses, but I think it was just one. Okay. And I had, I had assume, assumed something erroneous. And this, this is actually very helpful because, you know, we tend to project our own experience into the past and thinking it was always the same. But if I look at a picture, I think Dave Daly has some pictures of the whole band together when he was drum major. That's really a band made up of six different grades. Yeah. It, okay, I did not realize that. Of course, some of the people maybe didn't play well enough mm. in the seventh grade to be to participate in the public performances, okay. but they they had a class. Mm. You know, Mr. Brandon only taught music, so he had six periods, oh. and some of those periods may have been just how to play an instrument or how to get better, mm. and so some of the graders may not have been in the senior high band as such, but they eventually probably got into it by the eighth or ninth grade. Interesting. So so even so someone starting in your seventh grade year would have had Mr the same Mr. Brandon. Mr. Yeah, he Mr. Brandon was the only have, music teacher in high school. For I, and the junior high too? Was yeah. he okay interesting. I but did not you know, know he is he taught at the high school and if you were in junior high you had to walk to the high school. Oh, okay. So it wasn't just certain all junior high students had to go yeah. to the high school for their band period. Yeah, because they didn't teach any music at the junior high building. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. See, okay, this is, yeah, this is all new material to me. So, <laughs> and, and you, okay, and you gave the example of that one student courting around a euphonium yeah. in particular. in the case, you know, a heavy thing for a little guy tearing up the hill. And who was that again? Pete Camp. That was Pete uh, Camp. C-A-M-P. Camp, okay. Pete Camp, he's in the photo. You, yeah, I think I took a note of where he was in that lineup. So. So depending on the size of an instrument that you had when you were in junior high, it could be a very cumbersome yeah. enterprise. Yeah. That's, that's funny. So I guess John, John, uh, John uh, Ergel's choice of clarinet was fortuitous in that regard. Okay. Now I, go, I went on a long while about how much experience a junior high student could have with a high school band, but that was mainly because I was curious that the unstated uh, thought I was having as I was asking Rule about that is um, about how much exposure H.B. might have had to Betty Jo Booker when, when she, he was in band with her, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, basically the family, Alice Jo, the sister, she said to the Texarkana Gazette that she could not say whether H.B. knew how to drive an automobile two years ago at the time he committed suicide. She didn't say he didn't know how, she just said she couldn't say, which is an interesting construction. The older brother, Craig, however, said that he taught H.B. how to drive an automobile in the summer of 1947 in Parsons, Kansas, implying that H.B. didn't know how to drive a car when he was 16 years old. But this has been questioned. There are co first cousins I've spoken with doubt that that's true. Okay, the other thing that Alice Joe said in the Texarkana Gazette interviews after H.B. committed suicide is that, is that H.B. would frequently come to her house to babysit her children. She had two children. She lived in Robinson Courts. H.B. lived way over here. It's very strange to me that she would say that he frequently came to babysit her children and yet seemingly not know how he got there. I mean, if he, was, if he required a car to get there, then she would have said, oh yeah, I know he had to drive there. She, it's, it's just peculiar that she would say she didn't know whether he knew how to drive a car, but yet was aware he was getting here, because for him to go all the way across town, it seems probable to me that she would have known how he was getting there. If he was getting there because he didn't have to walk, or if he getting there because someone else had to drive him. Um, but yet she says she couldn't say whether he knew how to drive. So it's, it just strikes me as possibly evasive rather than answering the question. Okay, and of course, the other thing I'd mentioned before, this is the picture with, through the body of Cora, but H.B.'s holding, he's, I don't know how old he is, but he's holding a 22 rifle. Um, well, when the Texarkana Gazette asked about H.B.'s uh, knowledge of weapon, the older brother, J.D., said, duty showed no interest in guns or hunting. I doubt whether he knew how to load a gun, he said. I don't think that's true. I think he probably did know how to load a gun. Um, 
the sister, Alistair, said that he, to her knowledge, had never owned a gun other than an air gun, which he had when he was a little boy. She said, he didn't, she, said she did not believe he knew how to operate a gun. Um, and other thing in Alistair's memoir, this was not intended for public consumption, but she said, quote, um, that her older brothers taught her how not to play with a gun. She says, I was narrowly missed by a shot. The hole in the door and corner behind something are still there. That would have been the house at, at 602 Hickory Street. She also said in her, in her uh, memoir, I remember spending alone time in the backyard, here, boys, here the boys put up targets and bales of pay for BB gun practice. Um, so this is a 22 rifle. I, I've consulted with gun shop owners. We've, we're virtually certain that we understand the make of the gun, and, um, but it is definitely a 22 rifle. He's holding it in kind of this militaristic style of a, shoulder, of a soldier. These, uh, this is an empty box of cartridges at his feet. And um, I've identified it as being this particular guy. These are short, uh, short, 22 short. The gun could use 22 short or 22 long, either one. And uh, we've identified the gun as having been a Winchester Model 61 22 rifle, pre-World War II, which is of a takedown variety, which could be easily disassembled. Okay. Um, in the summer before HB committed suicide, um, this was a picture of him. This is his nephew. I've covered up the face of his nephew out of respect for his privacy, but this is HB. Uh, around August before he committed suicide. As you can see, he's gotten very tall, uh, seemingly remarkably taller than he was in high school. Um, and the, ne the nephew in this picture tells me that he believes that those photographs of HB holding the 22 rifle were taken at the farm of uh, HB's father's second wife. Okay, so there was a man named Henry Green Barnes who is said by the nephew to have had a farm somewhere north of Spring Lake Park, possibly north northeast, but somewhere north of Spring Lake Park. And he thinks that's where the family was that day um, when HB was holding the 22. But I haven't yet identified a specific location for the farm, so I'm still looking into that at this time. Okay, was there any relevance to the fingerprint or ballistics testing uh, that the newspaper suggested rule HB out? In short, no, there was not. It was completely irrelevant. He said in his suicide note that he disassembled the gun and discarded them in different places. The ballistic testing that was done was done on guns that had been in Memphis that he wouldn't have used anyway. It was completely irrelevant. Um, and just as in the case of Ewell Swinney and over 12,000 other sets of fingerprints, his fingerprints did not match what was on Martin's car. Okay, you know, if, it, if the killer even drove Martin's car, which is not clear, if he even did, they probably had enough sense to protect the, the, uh, their fingerprints from getting on the steering wheel. Are there any questions about anything that Jeremy or I have presented at this point in time? Any questions at all? Okay, okay, that's not a bad thing. Yeah, okay. Were you about to raise your hand? We were wondering yes, why Mr. Freeman was never like an actual suspect. Well, yes, there was, he wasn't really on the radar, although that woman in his family who said that he was known to the police, she did not qualify for that further to me, so he does not appear to have been on the radar of the police at the time. He appears quite the contrary. He, in some ways, he was helping them because they had already made a commitment. They had put Yule Swinney away for this, you know, uh, multiple offenses in terms of theft. And it was convenient for the, at the very least, for the law enforcement authorities when someone came forth and said, oh, by the way, here's an alibi for H.P. Tennyson, uh, you know, that, that basically makes it appear that he was, could not have possibly killed Starks. So James Freeman, the, the, the dark side, if you will, of James Freeman that's been elucidated by comments made by Benny Wood and his family members, None of that seems to have been on the radar of law enforcement authorities in 1948 or prior to that. So yeah, I, don't think, I don't think anyone would have had any reason to suspect him. I mean, he might have been introverted, but introversion is not a reason to suspect someone. Uh, you, know, you just don't know much about someone who's, who's quiet, who doesn't say much, which, which seems to be the case for James Freeman and HB as well. But yeah, he definitely, I mean, there's, he's become a person of interest and, um, you know, the kind, what kind of relationship? I mean, was it was it just a friendship? Was it possibly a sexual relationship? There have been some allegations that HB might have been a homosexual, um, and maybe he had a homosexual relationship with James Freeman, but that's purely speculative. I have no idea. But there have been family members as well as, believe it or not, there was another person named James Freeman. This is kind of convoluted, but there was another person who graduated in 1950 named James Freeman from Arkansas High School. His wife is still alive, and I'm talking to the son of that woman who's still alive, the son tells me that his mother says that the other James Freeman said that, that H.B. actually was beat up in high school with the belief that he was a homosexual and he might have actually told someone that, that he had, that he might made possibly some confession to killing someone in high school um, as well. So, so but, but uh, 
I have not been able to corroborate that. But that's the idea that of HB's orient sexual orientation also came up um, in uh, when I was having discussions with his nephew as well. That that some people thought he might be gay. So, yeah. and that and that and that you know, I, I have I have no moral judgment about that other than that I'm just saying that he might. Therefore, I wonder about what was his if he and James Stream were hanging out alone at the house together. Um, if, if if there's truth to that, then maybe there was more than just you know playing checkers or listening to the radio. So, and because there was a famous high profile case of two. Um, it was the Leopold and Loeb case um, in which they were considered to have been gay lovers and then they killed this young schoolboy almost just for the, for the thrill of killing. And it was this highly publicized case, I think it was in the 19, early 20s when that happened. So when I heard about James Freeman, when, when I learned about him and thought about the way he was coming forward and, and presenting this alibi for, for HB, it made me think of Leopold, Leopold and Loeb. But it's it's all speculative. But but um yeah, it, definitely a person of interest, I would say. But but do I I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say, say he's a suspect. He's just I think he's someone who's been deceptive, most likely about you know saying that that he was with HB that night. I don't I think that's more likely than not not to be true. So, okay. but any any other questions for Jeremy or me? Is there any explanation why the peculiar statements that Sweeney made alluded to something more? Than why he's being uh, he would arrest him for. I'm going to let Jeremy come and, and address that, and I might follow up and say a couple of things. You can, I'll click the alpha. Go, go ahead, Jeremy. Yes. Okay. What was the question again? Uh, has there been any explanation for those statements that Swinney made that alluded to him being arrested or doing something more than what he was arrested for? They uh, they just thought that they were strange statements, and at First, when he made them, they said they just kind of shrugged them off, didn't really think much about it. Mm -hmm. But then they said later on, when I guess when they did start doing some investigating, and he started becoming a suspect in the murders, they started thinking back about what he said, and they think that he's actually alluding to the Phantom murders mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. It's also worth adding that, that Max Tackett kind of went through a lot of special effort to apprehend Henry uh, Swinney on the day he was uh, uh, apprehended, and I think if 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 someone were being pursued with that degree of vigor, it might very well be natural to say, "Gosh, you want me for something more than auto theft? You want me for something?" Because the way you chased me out of the Jefferson Coffee Shop is was rather aggressive and maybe with a gun. With a gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was kind of strange. So so that could have compelled a, a kind of a generic statement of that sort as well. Did he ever? H.B. Tennyson. H.B. Uh, Tennyson is not known to have dated anyone. He's he uh, is was known to, to be very uh, reclusive, very shy, to have very few friends, and uh, in some ways to have a, a profile, if you will, that's in common with some people who were later learned to be serial killers. But he's not known to have any serious relationship. He is known to have expressed um, having, as he said, fallen in love with a 12-year-old girl who lived at the house that he was living at in Fayetteville before he committed suicide. Now, what he meant by saying he fell in love with her is not, was it a sexual attraction or something like just more affection for her innocence? Who knows? But, but no serious girlfriend that was age appropriate as far as we know. And, and was he a freshman? Yes, when he took his life, he was a freshman. He had just entered the University of Arkansas, um, and it was November 4th, that fall semester of his freshman year when he so took his life. Graves didn't even that's right, but there was documentation in the radio, uh, not the radio, in the newspapers about the fact he'd been skipping classes and not, not uh, he even made comments in his notes about the fact that, that the, he'd been performing poorly in his classes in college uh, and probably, I guess if there were incompletes, maybe they would have eventually been you know, given a specific grade, but he did have very poor performance in high school, uh, I know that for a fact, um, but I don't think it was because he was dumb, I think he just didn't care, he, was, he was, didn't seem to care about in doing well academically. Yes? Uh, I was just curious, <laughs> so now's the time. Um, on the depositions, you know, where Peggy and all the discrepancies, if, and what either one of you think about this, um, do you either one ever think that she was trying to set Yola up herself, even though she was kind of handed a lot of leading questions of Yola? Would she, you're saying, would she have had a motive to want to see yeah, him get have punished? Have you learned anything that would have told you that, that she was trying to? Throw him under the bus. I'll give you both <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jeremy. Okay. Uh, remember that uh, that one letter that she sent her parents. She was saying that she felt like that she would be 
sending him to the chair thinking he was innocent. So I don't think she would have been doing that on purpose. She, she stated actually in that that letter that she she felt like she was needed to tell them what they wanted to hear, basically, that they wouldn't believe in her story. And so I, I don't think it was any intention to just kind of put them in there. Okay. Yeah. Just curious. Yeah. What, what do you think about her being the mastermind behind his criminal activity? Do you think that she was the one that was wanting things, and so that's why he was doing these robberies and stealing cars? She, oh, she's... Hold that thought for one second. Let, let me on Pam's question. Let me just follow okay. just, oh, and then we'll, then we'll go right to that. Um, <laughs> but no, just a couple other things that, um, yeah, I mean, it certainly seemed like that Peggy felt bad about the possibility that you might go to this the electric okay. chair as a result of her being coerced into making confessions. So it seemed as though she was not comfortable with it, based on the candid, seemingly candid letter she wrote to her parents that was uh, confiscated by the authorities. And the other thing is is. Based on what I know about interrogation, based on what I know about statements, if you ever watched uh, the movie Thin Blue Line, there's a, it's, it's exemplary of that. But, but interrogators, she had at least 12 interrogators. That's documented in the FBI files. There's a lot of opportunity for contamination of information, and we don't have transcripts. You know, competent interrogations will always have a transcript of exactly what was asked and what a person said in response. They don't just have a narrative, a big, long paragraph narrative. So. It's very likely the case that the narratives that we see there that are referred to as Peggy's statements are actually not her verbatim statements. If you look at the letter she wrote to her parent, that looks to be like a verbatim letter of the, of the way she probably actually wrote. The statements are much, it, in general, are much better formed. Um, the interview that the polygraph examiner, Glenn McLaughlin, does of her appears to be more like an actual interview with a question and answer, although it's certainly not, it's, it's not a polygraph result. It's, it's an interview uh, and does not appear to be results of a... Of a yeah, yeah, but she's not being asked yes or no questions, and she's answering a narrative she's answer, rather than yes or no, which is the format of a polygraph, even in the 1940s. But, so I think the, the, you certainly need to consider the possibility that although the narratives might include elements of things that she said at one time or another, they are probably not her verbatim statements, and, and that's probably at least part of the reason that she didn't sign them. And they also they change in accordance over time with what the authorities are learning. So on the one hand, someone could say, well, she was coming clean. She, she eventually told them the truth, even though she didn't at first. But the other explanation is, well, no, they changed the narrative that they were trying to get her to sign as their theories about what happened changed. Yeah, when the saxophone was discovered, the narrative changes to reflect that exactly. as well. Okay, and then back to your question, uh, Ms. Blackburn, about was Peggy possibly the driving force for Swinney's crimes? Was she, would, did she motivate him to do whatever it is he might have done? I have never thought about that, but I'll let Jeremy defend that question. Only a woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll think about it while he's talking. I'll be thinking. About it. I guess that you know, I haven't, I haven't really uh, thought about that either. Um, <laughs> however, uh, he was uh, quite the criminal. You know, he he had a, a long record, and she did not have a record. So, I don't think him being this tough guy would have her control him. It, it would seem like he would be the one more controlling. Uh, he, he had his first burglary when he was about 12 or 13, and ever since then, I mean, he just kind of stayed in, known to the police ever since then. I mean, counterfeiting, grand larceny, all kinds of crimes, and I haven't heard of any record from, from Peggy, so it'd be kind of weird that, that she would have this mastermind and he wouldn't, so. She just wanted to stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, he, he probably got some <laughs> ego satisfaction out of having her around with him and, and whatever exploits they might have done together. But in terms of her actually being the one calling the shots, I, I don't know of any evidence that would make me think that. But does that come down to motive? I, I don't see motive on either one of them for doing such well, and, and serial killers are often characterized as having seemingly motivationless crimes. And that's actually in, in the profiling section of my slides, which I'll get to after five. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that because um, there, there's, a, there's something called a catathymic crisis, which is this, this model that explains kind of this release of tension and anxiety that some serial killers get from killing, although it's not a clear motive in, a, in some terms of a materialistic sense, that in, in terms of what most of us would have as a motive if we were to do Question there. Sure. Okay. Okay. Sorry about all the microphone switching. Yeah. Um, 
there's also this, I don't know if it's based on fact, but there's also, I've, I've heard that Swain, uh, Peggy wasn't really all there. That the, yeah, she was considered a little slow. Yeah. Well, there there were some elements of I don't, HB. I don't know if the camera would have picked up his uh, question. Okay, yeah. So let me repeat the question. That's a good point. So you were saying that the, there's the notes. Are you talking about the suicide notes or uh, all the notes? Like like uh, the lady writes to her home. When she writes home. It's typed out. Uh, mm. uh, I, I wouldn't know that you in those days that you have that much access, particularly if you're in jail. Well. Yes, that's a good point. That comes from an FBI file. Now, maybe that was transcribed, but, but there were typographical errors that would seem odd to transcribe, so maybe they transcribed it verbatim even with the typographical errors, but it was from an FBI file, FBI file so it seems to be a legitimate letter that she wrote. Yeah, it does look like, uh, because they, you know, in the FBI file, it's got underlines under, like, misspelled words, so it's like they, they pointed that out in the FBI file, I guess, as a verbatim to, make, to show that this was her mistake. That's a good point. Yeah, that they weren't making the mistake themselves. Yeah. Yeah. One last thing I want to ask about. It seems to me that there were two instances of people who might have information that was really significant, Peggy and the lady who repaired the shirt. Both of them changed their mind because they did not want to be the one person responsible for causing someone else's death. That was a concern for them. Sure. Yeah. And they, you wonder if they were being honest, or you know, I mean, I, I imagine a woman so sewed up a hole in a shirt and, and it's her husband's work shirt, particularly in the time just after the uh, depression, that she remembered. True, true. Although you don't really know what kind of leading question or how the question might have been asked to her initially, and in terms of exactly what she said or didn't say in response to a particular question. But um, yeah, I think that if it was actually Virgil's shirt, it's Virgil's shirt, it seems like she would have been familiar. But based on that, 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 uh, that uh, photographic image of the star, it doesn't even seem to say Starks anyway. I mean, from if, unless that's a highly distorted mm -hmm. image. So it, yeah, it seems to, to not say Starks on it. So it seems like it could go either way. Without an S in it. That's true. I, uh, I am frequently called Dr. Duncan's. You know. I know what you're talking. Yes, S is either get added or dropped. Either way, you're right. Mm -hmm. you're, you're right. So, I, to my sense is there's uncertainty about it. I just I, I, don't, I don't conclude one thing or the other. I remain agnostic about the shirt. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to do that. And before I get to that, there's a few things I'm going to say about the. Paramount Theater, but this all gets down to the this idea of, of proximity analysis. That that one form of circumstantial evidence is if you know that someone has a much greater chance or probability of being proximal to places where victims were on the day they were killed, then that is more consistent with someone who was in that same location having been responsible than if you know they weren't or if you were just randomly selecting someone who probably didn't have as high of a possibility. And that's why I wanted to talk about the Paramount Theater. Um, H.B. worked as a, when he was in high school, 1946, that 45-46 school year, he worked as an usher at the Paramount Theater. Other people in his class also worked as ushers there, that, with whom I've spoken. It's now the Pro Theater, but here's what I learned when I started looking at the victims. The first set of victims who were attacked had gone to see this movie, Three Strangers, at the Paramount Theater on Friday, February 22nd. They were then attacked later that evening. The second uh, couple that was attacked, Richard Griffin and Polly Moore, had also gone to the Paramount Theater to see the movie Snafu on March 23rd uh, at the Paramount Theater. Uh, the third couple, uh, Betty Jo Booker was actually not with Paul. He, however, had gone to the theater with Tom Albritton and Ramona Putnam, and they had gone to see Black Market Babies at the Paramount Theater. So as it turns out, uh, Five, I'm going to go back a minute. Um, this pattern suggests that someone affiliated with the Paramount Theater or a frequent moviegoer to the Paramount Theater might be connected to the first three attacks. Of course, the Starks were not at the theater. Um, and H.B. Tennyson not only was an avid moviegoer, he also worked as an usher at the Paramount Theater. I don't know that he worked there on those particular nights, 
but it's certainly, he, as compared to an average or randomly selected Texarkana citizen, he would have a much higher chance of having been there on a weekend. Okay, um, so that's, that's certainly worth, worth considering. Um, the fact that essentially five uh, of the five of, of the first three couples that were attacked, five of those had been to the Paramount Theater on the evening that they were attacked. Okay. Um, another thing that this is going to get to the interview with Janan Gleason. Uh, Janan told me a couple years ago that approximately at 3 p.m. on Saturday, April the 13th, 1946, this is the Saturday that Betty Jo Booker uh, later that evening or early morning Sunday was murdered, but that uh, Janan told me that she learned of Betty Jo's plan to be with Paul Martin that night at the Towers restaurant, which was this place that had curb service, and it was a very popular high school hangout. Rule Beasley has verified that as well. It was on East 7th Street, and uh, the high school students would sit out on the cars and talk, and it was in that context that Betty Jo Booker told Janan and her other friends that she was going to be with Paul that night. So this is another teenager context where Betty Jo potentially could have been overheard um, Tell, expressing her plans for later that night with Paul. Okay, so here's Janine Gleason. She's my, she's my grandmother's uh, niece, uh, and I believe that, I think it makes her my first cousin once removed, if I have that right. You had mentioned that you had been uh, good friends or even best friends with Betty Jo Booker. Yeah. Do you, do you feel comfortable talking about what you remember about Betty Jo? I'm just well, yeah, curious. you know, she's she was 15, you know, when she was killed and all. But we went all, of course, I moved here in 41 and I was 11, so junior high is when we grew up together. And was the junior high, was it called Arkansas Junior High? That yeah, time? That it's down there now where those apartments are, okay. right down on Garland, Right. all right. that. And then, of course, Arkansas High was over. So they, there was not a name other than just Arkansas in front of the name? I don't know. Arkansas Junior High School. Arkansas Junior High. So you and, and, of course, we were best friends and... A bunch of us, you know, when you're that idea of gangs, our bunch of little gangs, Pat Ray and Benny and Smith and Booker and me and Joanne Sullivan, and there's a whole bunch of us that we just ran around together. Starting in junior high? Starting in junior high. Of course, I just moved here. They were already friends. <laughs> My good friend Elder, she always said, well, how did you get in with all those good people? <laughs> I said, I don't know. Anyway, we were just, you know, just did everything kids do and then her mother worked for um, what was a cement company here uh, Gifford Hill okay right for sure and I forget what we called her Ms. B and of course she remarried to a man named Brown mm -hmm. so we called him Mr. B of course she was married to Booker the You're man right. Betty Jo did not change her last name no her no because they married I guess up after but anyway then we called her Ms. B and Mr. B and they lived down, down there, right on Jefferson, just right off of Jefferson there, at, uh, by the school now. The house is still down there. What, but, do you know what street they were on off of Jefferson? That's uh, the one that runs from Jefferson all the way out to the highway, oh, right at the school. At the school. Yeah, right at the end of the school where you've got that thing going this way now. They lived in the, I believe, the second house there. There's that, there's that building over like it's like Hickory. If you go down Hickory Street, about Sixth and Hickory, it's, a, it's an armory building or something. You know what I'm talking? Oh about? yeah, the old armory. Did they did they ever play bands? Or did bands perform there, or was that never used as a venue for music? Uh, we used to have dances there back in my day. The old armory. Yeah, I think that's what yeah. it is. Yeah, it's just off of Hickory, Sixth and Hickory. Yeah, right there, that big old. Yeah, it looks like it looks like that, Alamo uh, almost. It kind of shaped. That's. The side. Uh, so there were dances held there for sure. Oh, way back when we were like in, in high, high school. school. Yeah. So, but, so in the 1940s, there were live, there was live music being played there. Yeah. In yeah. terms of Betty Jo Booker and that there was this slumber party that you were having that night when she was. Well, I say slumber party. There, I can't. Uh, right now, I can't. We could not talk to Pat about it. I know Pat was there and Betty Ann Smith and me. That might have been all. And that was Pat Abernathy. Well, we lived right over here and. We just had that one little bedroom, so it couldn't have been. It wasn't much like of, a big party. <laughs> well, so there's, wasn't there were three, no. three girls that you know of. So, then that morning, mother came in and uh, said Ms. Booker Brown had called and wondered if Betty Jo had spent the night over here. And of course, she hadn't. And uh, 
So we didn't know what to do, but she had not come home that night. So we, of course, got busy and called around the, the different friends of hers to see if she had spent the night and got we got in the, a car. I don't know who had a car, but and started went around to several of the people that were her friends to see if she had spent the night with them, and she had not. So we knew that she had gone out with Paul because he was here. We saw her that afternoon. I think, you remember the White Castle? Um, it used to be up. Is it like someone's house? No, it's a restaurant. Oh, no, I, I was, I was not uh, trying to think what's up there now. Right there on 7th Street. 9th Street. No, that's 7th over there. Uh, anyway, it was a drive-in thing. It's called where, the White Castle. Where everybody met and did, and we drove up there that afternoon, and we saw her. A bunch of us had been together. And so she, she, was, she was hanging out with Paul already? No, uh-uh, no. Oh, she was not. I don't even know who she was with, but anyway, she was to play that night, and he had called and wanted her to go with him, and she didn't want to go. But I guess she did. <laughs> she did know, go with him. Do you know how he persuaded her to go anyway? No, he was just a good friend, and they had dated, I okay. assume, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, he was living at the time out of town. His parents lived right down uh, on Locust. That house, it's 12th and Locust. It's a white house. Kind of got a fence around it now. That was his home. So he was from Texas County? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. He was raised with us. So then I don't know what made us decide we'd go out the park, you know, because that's where everybody parked. So we drove in out there and we got down to the, where you go in, that where all that brick, the, the, where it says the, Spring the, Lake Park. The original there. entrance. And then the park road went right on down here. And as we came in, we saw this car down there with a policeman standing by it. And so we drove down there, and we knew it was Paul's. It was a little coupe, I think, a mm -hmm. little two-seated coupe. That's, that's what I heard. Yeah. And uh, so we asked the policeman. We said, we know whose car that is, you know. And he said, he told us then that they had found the boy mm -hmm. and that he had been shot. That's At that theory. time, nobody knew where she was. Yeah. And uh, so they got, a, will say, a posse, mm -hmm. fathers and everybody. So, so when you saw Mary uh, Joe Booker at the at the White Castle earlier in the day, she she had indicated that she was going to go out with Paul Martin that night. Yeah. So, so that at least you kind of knew that she was with yeah. him. And, yeah. At that time. Or so what, that's why we knew it was his car, just you know, because we knew she was with him, and that was his car. So. And then the, the girls. It was, so it was you and and Pat Abernathy at the party, and then or the. Betty and Smith, I guess Betty was. And, they couldn't. My, Two or three of us is about all. Then we picked up others as we went around to their house, you know, to see, yeah. Okay. And, uh, but as far as the night before, what would, what would have been the sleepover or slumber party? It was just like the three of you? I, as far as no you know, more than four, mm -hmm. probably three. So it wasn't like, okay. Together. No, it wasn't a big party or anything. I, I know that like some of the historical accounts talk about a slumber party. And oh, they make yeah, it a big sound party. Like, yeah, make it sound like a larger <laughs> Yeah, event. no, this, they just spent the night. I think I've even heard some accounts refer to it as a sorority party, but it wasn't yeah, that because no. we were just in high school. So it couldn't really have been a sorority yeah. party. So you know how things get retold. The more you tell it, distorted. Well, that's why, that's why I'm, I'm so appreciative of you recall, yeah. recalling what you do recall yeah. because my mother said that she thought you had been friends with Betty Jo Booker. Yeah, and we were, of course, we were all of us best friends. And uh, then the men, of course, started searching. I don't know how they even knew where to go to search. Yeah, I'm assuming she hadn't told her parents that she was going out with Paul. or that, were, they, were they aware that Paul was in Well, town? I never must not have. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, I guess they would have... You know, I don't know. When Betty Jo had gone out with, with Paul Martin, was the city already in a state of fear, or had it not ramped up to the to the degree that it would later become at that time? I, yeah, I don't remember even being scared because mm -hmm. of the other one, the first one. Mm -hmm. I guess we weren't. Yeah. You know, I mean, of course, we, I guess, knew about it and all, but not till this happened, till we. Well, who's the guy here in town, and he has called me. 
Who's the guy here that's writing all this? Um, well, there, and I was going I, to I write can, a book or I can. Oh, well, Jim Presley is that's probably it. yeah. Jim Presley's the one. He's the nephew of the sheriff Presley, Bill Presley, oh. who was sheriff in Bowie County at the time. Yeah, and he called uh, this other friend of mine, Georgia Daly. She worked for the Gazette. She interviewed Miss B and had it on tape. I've asked, I've way back asked her to let me hear it, and she didn't want to let me listen unless she is sitting there and I think in the move and all whatever she's done. She might have given it to him. But he may have it because she called me wanting me to talk to him. Hmm. And I didn't particularly want to talk to him. What, she ever lost it and she moved, sold her place and moved. and So I don't think she even has it anymore. And she said it was so bad you couldn't understand hardly. You know, back in the old, oh, when like she taped it. Bad quality. No yeah. telling what she taped it on. Okay, so that's just a slice of Janan Gleason's recollection. Um, not all of that is relevant specifically to H.B. Tennyson, other than the idea that at the, what she called the White Castle, which she later elaborated was the Towers Restaurant, that that was a public context where teenagers, such as H.B. Tennyson or others, could have heard about uh, the plans of Betty Jo Booker for that night. And um, so I'm going to, what I'm going to do is, let me, let me close up with this thought, and then if anyone wants to segue out, um, they can do so, and otherwise I'll continue from here. Um, but this is all built up to a culmination of this idea of increased opportunity for familiarity with and proximity to victims. So just a few highlights, the fact that Betty Jo Booker and H.B. were in marching band together at Arkansas High School and, until Betty Jo transferred. There's little doubt that H.B. Uh, knew Betty Jo Booker. Betty Jo Booker is said to have known H.B. Uh, another victim, Richard Griffin, lived at Robinson Courts where H.B. is said by his sister to have spent significant amounts of time babysitting his sister's children. Uh, Katie's sister's husband, so this of course is, this is Ed Russell we're talking about, worked at the Tenson Brothers factory where H.B. also worked in that same factory during the summers. Although I wouldn't say, you know, H.B. obviously had a chance to meet the Russells under the roof where, where Benny and Wood and Don lived anyway, even if it wasn't at the Tenson Brothers factory. And then also H.B.'s sister Alice Joe worked at the Red River Arsenal and that was also a common note for other people. Polly Ann Moore also worked at Red River Arsenal and Mary Jean Larry's father also worked at the Red River Arsenal. Obviously the Arsenal's a big place, but but there are lots of things, all of this in addition to the things about the Paramount and the-, the John, I believe Mary worked there too. Oh, Mary, which one? Oh, Mary Jean worked there as well? Okay, thank you. So yeah, so one more. So, so there's potential paths of correspondence which I don't think have been revealed to have been as strong or as present for Yule Swinney as compared to H.B. Tennyson. The, the Paramount Theater example is probably the most poignant of all of those in, in my opinion. Um, so here's that other, I showed this to you before, but just, just the idea that that um, the saxophone players and the trumpet players set proximal to each other in the marching band. I haven't positively identified any of these people as being Betty Jo, H.B., or James, but it's possible. And here's a summary of H.B. relative to the different victims. I've shown this before. This is actually on the website diddutydoit.com, but this is a summary of some of the things I've already said about the way in which he could have had familiarity or proximity to uh, the victims. Okay. So basically, as I suggested before, the proximity analysis basically shows that as compared to what be con could be considered an average randomly selected person from Texarkana in 46, H.B. appears to have had a significantly greater than average opportunity to have been familiar with or to have been proximal to at least one, if not both individuals, in each of the four couples who were attacked. 